Um, hello, everybody, again. Those that I didn't see uh, yesterday, welcome and thank you for having me. Uh, so, many of you do know me because your kids have had therapy with me, either for the upper extremity, working on that weaker hand and arm, or for the gait therapy, learning to walk better. Uh, and those who do not know me, uh, I've been working uh, for Dr. Maiden for more than a decade, actually, at UCLA. And a uh, long time ago, when we, when we started thinking about therapy after hemispherectomy, there was not much there. I mean, there was nothing there. And uh, there were so many issues related to hemispherectomy as it started that therapy looked as, as if it was something that will never happen. And I'm very happy that now many years ago we have so much interest in rehabilitation techniques after hemispherectomy. And yesterday I talked a little bit about, uh, quite, actually quite a bit about language and uh, how it is important to take into consideration the etiology, the side, in uh, trying to understand how the language in our kids develop. Today I will talk uh, a little bit about PT and OT that we have done and I'm not a PT, I'm not a physical therapist. I'm a neuroscientist trained um, in many things. My neuroscientific uh, training is in cortical plasticity. And I want to tell you a couple of words about cortical plasticity and why it is so important for your kids. Um, cortical plasticity, uh, when I was a student 10, 15 years ago, people would say that cortical plasticity is this a good thing, it's a magic term. What happens is if you do have damage into your, your, in your brain, cortical plasticity will help you to recover or to recover some of your functions back. That was about 10, 15 years ago. Now we know much more about cortical plasticity and we know that cortical plasticity occurs to us every day, every second. As a matter of fact, as you're listening to me and trying to digest all the new information that I'm providing you with, your brain will emerge changed following this presentation. But only if you follow. <laughs> so this is the everyday cortical plasticity. And when we ask you to use language on a daily basis with your children or to use other uh, therapeutic approaches, what we are actually telling you is take advantage of that cortical plasticity that is already there, that happens in every brain, in, in brain with two hemispheres, in brain with one hemisphere. Every day we have a potential to change our brains as we are learning something new. So every day we go to bed with a brain that looks a bit different from our previous day. So that is cortical plasticity in the brain that did not know any insult. For our kids, they suddenly found themselves with only one hemisphere. And cortical plasticity holds all the promise for our kids. Because everything that has been supposed, supposed to be in two hemispheres now has to be developed in that one hemisphere. And it's not easy for that one hemisphere, and we, we all know we see it, that it's not easy for these children. It's not easy for our children to acquire everything with one hemisphere. So sometimes it's ta it takes much longer. It's very laborious. It's a hard work for you. It's hard work for them. But that's the effect of that cortical plasticity that changes their brains every day. When we started thinking about therapies, I was started thinking from the point of view of what I know about the brain. And I knew about cortical plasticity and I wanted to look at the field of the physical therapy to see what's out there, um, how people use the cortical plasticity. And the first shock came to me when I realized that, uh, well, sometimes in the physical therapy, people just don't even look at the brain. They just look at the presentation. Our kids present a cerebral palsy and that's where it stops. So. I hope that was 10, 15 years ago, so I hope now it has changed greatly, but that's how it was 10, 15 years when we started. So what we did, we invited, I think, 12 courageous families to UCLA. They were not paid for traveling to UCLA. They were not paid for staying there. And we organized this therapy for two weeks. For two weeks, we trained these 12 kids after hemispherectomy to walk. And the technique that that time was not that widely known. 
That technique was called body weight support treadmill training. Um, after that, we had a couple of pulses. Dr. May and, and, and I got a grant to do it, and some of you came to me to University of South Carolina where we had training. Um, eventually, I did some training in, in the Netherlands. And the, these are the trials that I'm going to talk today about, and some of them have been published. So if you have more questions and uh, uh, you cannot ask me today, feel free to drop me an email and I'll uh, uh, send you an article. If you would like to take that article to your physical therapist and to show your physical therapist and say, this is what I want to do, and then also please add, feel free to write to Stella with your questions, if you have questions about how to do this therapy with my child. Okay, I, I did show 3D uh, sort of a movie of the same brain yesterday, so those who uh, listened to me yesterday saw that in the 3D, but this is what the uh, three uh, planes of the same brain that you saw yesterday, that's what it looked like, that's what, that is our hemispherectomy children. This is the example of the anatomical um, hemispherectomy. And here where cortical plasticity comes in place. Now look carefully. What you see is in the brain we have two tracts that control voluntary movements. We have tons of tracts, cortical tracts, that travel all the way from the brain to the muscles, conveying the message what we want to do, voluntary movement. But only one tract is voluntary. So lots of them do their job, you don't even realize what you are doing. Corticospinal is actually tells your hand to do, to grab a um, a cup, for example, or to write. This is your corticospinal tract. Corticospinal tract crosses. That's why if your child loses right hemisphere, it is the left hemisphere that will be weak. There is, however, the part of the tract that doesn't cross. So look here. This is called the ipsilateral part of the tract. If you looked at the percentage, this is an approximation. So people say, Nobody knows for sure, but they say between 10 to 20 percent of the corticospinal tract does not cross. So now that one hemisphere is gone, I have to work with your child who presents with two parts of the body. One is innervated by corticospinal tract just the way it should be. The other part, the weaker side, what does it have going for it? only about 10 percent, 10 to 20 percent of that ipsilateral corticospinal tract that did not cross. So before we start any therapy, we have to remember there are some things that we can do with 10, 20 percent and there are some that we will have some limitations that um, you know, explain just by the fact that we are working with 10, 20 percent instead of 100 percent. And why I told you about cortical plasticity? Because the remaining hemisphere also has to establish the fact and reorganize itself, making sure that it now works not just for one side, but for both sides. Um, as, as a neuroscientist, I know these principles by heart. And that's what your physical therapist hopefully uses in his or her practice. First of all, practice makes perfect. Enhanced stimulation increases cortical representation. The more you work with that side, the more you bombard that side with sensory motor information, the more it gets sort of entrenched in the brain. Because the, the brain wouldn't mind to forget about that side at all. Um, we, we have to remind that that side exists. We have to remind the brain. We, ha we have to send signals. I exist. I exist from that weak side. Use it or lose it. Lack of efferent input is detrimental. It is so tempting not to use that side that it's, it's, it's a vicious circle. You start using it less, you notice it less, then you start using it even, even less and less, and eventually, before you know, you don't even notice that that side exists. You do everything on one side. Fire together, wire together. If we make muscles work together, those muscles that work together, that wire together, that, that fire together in their work, they eventually end up being represented in the cortex, in the brain, next to each other. 
So if we make you walk, if I make your child walk on the treadmill, we're not introducing just one isolated movement. It's, it's a whole stepping again and again and again. It's also moving your weaker hand and together with your stronger hand. It's all this gain and velocity parameters. So it's lots and lots of muscles firing together. And that's what I want the brain to remember, how they fired all together. So when, they, uh, when we started looking for therapies, Dr. May and I looked for novel therapies um, because we were not very happy with the therapies that we saw existing at the time. And traditional therapies in physical therapy, again, this is for 10, 15 years ago, it's the use of assistive devices, it's substitution of movements. These are all good things. But we thought, well, just neuro, neuro, from the neuroscience point of view, they help our children, yes, but do they utilize the ability of the brain to reorganize? Not really. So what would be the therapies that would help the brain to reorganize? And these are the therapies that I call novel, even, even though I have to say that now, 10, 15 years later, these are, they are much more accepted than they were when, when we started. So what do we know about these novel therapies? The graph on your left-hand side is a constraint-induced therapy. So the lower line is a constraint-induced therapy without any, uh, excuse me, it's just traditional therapy, traditional physical therapy. The top two lines that show much greater improvements, it's for constraint-induced therapy. So at that time, constraint-induced therapy just started, and people were arguing back and forth whether it works or not. So this chart shows that, yes, the improvements following constraint-induced therapy, at least in adults, is, is um, um, much better than without. How does it work? What people postulated that what happens if when you isolate your good hand, there is a tiny connection there which you normally don't use, but when you isolate the good hand and make the child do everything or the adult with his or her weak hand, you sort of unmask those existing connections that are there but are not working. You're sort of forcing them to work. Um, so we looked around and uh, we, this is not the very first pulse that happened uh, at UCLA 10 years ago. This is a um, study that took place in the University of South Carolina. We call it intensive mobility training, and uh, some of you participated in that training. And this is why we chose body weight support treadmill training, because we believe that all the principles of neuroscience that I told you about, they are all utilized in this approach. What you see here is a child is wearing a harness for body support, and then there are two therapists sort of imitating the way the child, the child should walk properly, and that all of that happens on the treadmill. As the child is getting better and better and is able to support her body weight, the harness is still there for safety, but she, in the end, is already bearing her own weight without any support. What we did was one hour of this, which is very intensive, it's very tiring, and then following it immediately, two hours of overground training, meaning everything we uh, taught the child on the treadmill in a very safe environment, wearing the harness, we ask the child to repeat the same mo motions, but just walking in the real life, climbing stairs, walking, jumping, running. I, I wanted to show you a video, but it's unfortunately doesn't work. So why we call it IMT, intensive mobility training, and not the body weight support treadmill training, because we wanted to make sure that although we cannot constrain one leg and make the weaker leg work harder, we concentrate, because you do need two legs after all to walk, but we need that we made sure that we paid attention. For three hours, the child was reminded, no, step with your heel, do this, do this, pay attention to your weaker leg, uh, pay attention, pay attention, pay attention. For three hours, we were hammering in their poor heads to really pay attention to that one weaker leg. 
That's why we th think that our therapy is as if we took constraint-induced therapy that now exists for the upper extremity, for the hand and arm, and we use it actually for the lower extremity because all our focus was on that weaker uh, leg. But the tasks remain the same that you, uh, you have when you work with, with your physical uh, uh, therapist. We wanted to approximate all kinds of normal movements that lead to normal gait and normal walking velocity. We wanted to, as much as we can, eliminate that limp and make sure our kids walk safely without tripping over themselves. Uh, this is our protocol, in case you want to say it to your therapist when you come home. We had um, 10 days of therapy, five days, weekend, and the five days. Three hours a day, it was uh, individualized. Usually we had three to four therapists working with a child. One hour on a treadmill, then one hour at improving balance, and one hour muscle coordination and, and strengthening. Uh, we had 20... Uh, children, teenagers, and young adults all after hemispherectomy from all over the country. Um, the ages were, the youngest were two six-year-olds and the oldest was a 24-year-old. Uh, they had all kinds of time of, uh, of post-surgery windows. So we had patients who only had surgery one year ago and we had uh, some young adults had as many as 12 years. So they were considered chronic patients and they haven't received their therapy for years because uh, the, the, the claim was they do not get any better. This is what our therapy looked like. So in the middle uh, top row you see the child in the harness and th then you see all kinds of activities we did for two remaining hours practicing the skills that children learned in our um, body weight support treadmill session. All 20 kids improved. Um, however, now we are still analyzing the data. And our biggest challenge is to understand who improves what. We didn't have a single child who did not improve either in velocity or on balance, on strength, uh, on, on the way they walk, on the gait per se, symmet symmetricity of their gait. So we had every, every single participant improved. Uh, three kids who came to us in wheelchairs, um, two of them were able to ambulate without armchairs and one needed a limited use of the armchair before, because, not because we did something uh, revolutionary, I don't think so. It's also training uh, of the strength. These children, after the, they trained so much, 30 hours is a long time, they just gained strength. Um, many, many kids did not need their A4 when they left as well. So this is shows you in, uh, these are just more for physical therapists, but these are the, all the measures related to gain, walking, balance, and velocity. And uh, in the percentage in, in this row, it tells you how many percent uh, of our participants, of 20 kids, how many uh, improved. Next one. This is another set of parameters also related to the gait. Uh, toe in and out means, and you probably know, uh, the kids tend to um, walk with their toe almost up to, we see it, up to 90% to the side rather than f uh, walking like forward. So we worked uh, on that, we measured it pre and post. And 80% of our kids improved of that. Stride length is, is just the length of how, how far they can walk with that weaker leg. And step symmetry, which is really important for walking. It's important that our steps, we do it automatically, we don't even pay attention, but our kids, the way they walk, their walk is very unsymmetrical and also leads to uh, falling. So we improved step, step symmetry. So in changes, if you look at the percentage, you will see that the, I'd say from 50 to 80% of all participants Im improved on every measure. And every, at, at least on two, three different measures, every kid improved. There were kids who improved on ten different measures, and there were some who improved on three measures. So I, I will be honest with you. I don't know how much it will help, help your child. We saw improvements, but it, it is your call and your child's call to decide whether you want to try doing something like that 
and how much you want to get out of it. And there are a couple of families who did this therapy with us, so maybe they um, have something to say about pluses and minuses. So th that is about the gait therapy that we did. Now I would like to say a few words about the upper extremity therapy that we did using the same principles, the same approach as I told you about. So it's practice and it's taking in consideration the fact that we're working with one isolated hemisphere, not two hemispheres. So we took the standard definition of constraint-induced movement therapy and that is a sustained and repeated practice of functional arm movements of the paretic limb. We did struggle uh, with a splint and we went to best minds uh, in, in, in this country, um, people who were pioneers in introducing constraint induced movement with children like, like Professor Gordon in New York. And um, we got the unilateral uh, unanimous uh, agreement that providing a restraint with a cast is not a good idea. And the major concern is uh, the adult studies who looked at that show that it's very traumatic for a child. And also for our children specifically, it's not safe. If the child with a cast falls and her, her good hand is in the cast and there is no way to stop, the consequences can be devastating. So after going back and forth, we decided against uh, cast and we just used a soft constraint for, for, for our kids. And we did the same protocol, 30 hours total in 10, hour, in 10 days. These are the activities. The activities were all sort of fun to participate, but what it was important was that we could choose the activities that kids could do, because you know how limited they are in their upper extremities. So the key was to choose activities w which they could do and we could work on. So each child received completely different approach and completely different uh, activities. And that's, uh, that's, that's the thing. That will be the same. Whether you have four children or 40, 40 children after hemispherectomy, they all will be different. They all will require an individualized approach based on what is interesting to your child, what's the cognitive level of your child, and, and only then what it is your child can do with that hand uh, and, and that wrist. Because if the child is not interested, then it's a waste of time. Keeping them interested was the most difficult part of our therapy. The kids that you, show, you saw on, on the picture before, they all improved. So how did we measure that? We looked at the amount of use of that paretic side. Not when we ask them, but spontaneous, uh, spontaneously. Sorry. So we would introduce activities, and they don't even know we're taping them. But we would see how much they used that weaker side in their everyday activities before therapy and after therapy. So they did improve, uh, all of them improved in their amount of use, but those who were much lower in the beginning improved the most. The same for quality of use. So we use what, uh, if they do move their operatic hand, how well do they do it? That's what we wanted to know. This is a box, this is a standard test, box and block, and we asked every child to put, uh, to, to use uh, hers or he, her, his or her weak side and to remove blocks from one side of the box into another. And we wanted to know how this would change with therapy. So some of them improved dramatically from uh, four to 10. Um, others improved less, but they all improved at least a little bit. We also looked at the brain of all children who came to us to participate in this therapy. We wanted to know, since our premises is we are working primarily with the brain, Okay, we are training the hand or we are training the gait, but what we want to get to is the brain. We want to remodel the brain. We wanted to decode those changes that we are trying to introduce and to use it in everyday life, even after these children leave us and start going without therapy on their daily basis. And what we saw it was that, and this is still also we're trying to figure out, some of our kids showed exactly that. They showed that 
after therapy, the amount of the brain that was working for that weaker hand, in some kids we couldn't even see it, it was so weak, we couldn't even see it in the brain before therapy, then we could clearly see where the brain works after the therapy. So it was like a wake-up call for these kids. Then there was another group of kids, and these kids came to us with a pretty strong hand function. And those kids actually decreased the amount of the brain they activate when they do something. And it, in general, it does make sense, because if I ask you to learn a new function, uh, you know, you have control of two hands, and I ask you tomorrow to learn juggling and I will teach you juggling for two weeks. What I will see is in the beginning, the amount of the brain you use for juggling will be very little because you don't know how to do it. And then you are really struggling to follow my instructions. The amount of the brain you use goes up. And then when you are good, if you are good, the amount of the brain you are, you are using for the same activity goes down. So we see that the brains of our kids, they work very similar. Those who came to us, and we couldn't even, pre-therapy, we couldn't even identify which area of the brain was working for that paretic hand. They left, we could at least see, okay, this is the area of the brain that works for the paretic hand. And some kids who came to us and they, we already saw the part of the brain working for that weak hand, those parts got less, but we, have, uh, we, we still don't have enough data to um, run a big analysis and just lots of conclusions, that's why I'm, I'm being cautious, but it seems that well, the good news is that the remaining hemisphere in our kids works just the way you would expect from you and me. So when we know that, we can utilize that, that fact in therapy. This is what I was telling you about. So on your left-hand side, you see the red spot. This is a brain activating for the strong hand. And you see it's almost, there is a little bit of blue at the bottom plate, that's all we could see for the weaker hand in, in this child. And the same child is post-therapy. If you look at the images, you see that we have green and cyanide and red together. This is that weaker hand that we couldn't see before therapy. Um, it's, it, it shows very prominently after therapy. And it was also interesting for us to find out where will that part of the brain uh, for the hand will activate. Where will, it, will we find it? Because if you think about it, okay, we know it's the same corticospinal tract, so we sort of, our hunch was that it would be close to the stronger hand representation, but we really didn't know because it hasn't been done before. So that's why all of you who participated in that therapy had to do brain imaging before and after. Our question was, we are looking for the cortical representations of that weak hand, where is it? Now we know after looking again and again, and it's not only for the hand, it's also for the gait, that when we do find representation for the weaker side, the paretic side, it's always very close to the good side. That time it was very good news. We, we answered uh, one of our questions, but it's, it, it introduced also a problem that I will mention in a couple of seconds. What we realized is that, yeah, our approach is cautiously speaking, because we still didn't run a study of 100 hemispherectomy patients. All we had was probably, all together was 40, maybe 50, 55 together with the Dutch participants that I had in the Netherlands. So, but it seems that these novel approaches can make the difference for our children, even for those who have been told for years that they are not gonna get any better because they reach the plateau. We didn't see a single child, a single young adult or individual who did not improve. And I believe that if we start doing these therapies again and again and again, at least giving children a pulse of therapy once a year, we will see improvements again and again and, and, and again. Um, however, what I want to caution you about is the last year's uh, studies, not in humans, so far they are only in animals. They showed that if you do work with this ipsilateral corticospinal tract, the only one that is left for our children after hemispherectomy, you have to be really careful because it may be very aggressive. And what we realized is the fact that these two hands or two legs, they are so close in the brain 
the, they are sharing the cortical potential, so they actually influence each other. That's why when these findings came to be known, and I was at that time in the Netherlands, we sort of stopped using constraint-induced therapy, and instead, only for our patients, for cerebral palsy, they still use constraint-induced therapy, but for children after hemispherectomy, we completely switched to approach that's called the bimanual therapy. Why I'm so keen on bimanual therapy these days? Well, first of all, we saw very good results in our gait therapy, which was sort of bimanual because both legs were working even though we were trying to isolate one leg. The results of bilateral training reported in the literature are very, very promising. In fact, last year there was a first study published. It was a, a, a study when they compared constraint-induced therapy to the bimanual therapy, to controls receiving regular therapy. And they showed that constraint induced did really, it was not for hemispherectomy children, it was for cerebral palsy. Constraint induced was good, bimanual was better. So the results now, uh, even in pediatrics, show that bimanual approach may be what we, what we are uh, trying to get here. Uh, finally, what was why in Holland we abandoned constraint induced therapy it was a study. It was not done by us. Um, it was done in London, but it showed a bit unexpectedly for all of us that the good side in all children and young adults post hemispherectomy is just not good. On some measures, it was 70% of where you would expect it to be. On other measures, it was 80, but it was never more than 80% of the good side. We don't know what causes it. Whether the fact that it's the same brain area that now, that used to be responsible only for one side of the body, now it has to work for two parts of the body. And they interact in a way we don't know. So that, that remains a big question. But because of all that, um, I feel that for example, when we would like to start therapy here in Rancho Los Amigos in Downey, and you will hear it uh, right after me, I would be a big proponent of using what we started doing in the Netherlands, which is we, we introduced what's called bimanual therapy with the elements of the constraint-induced therapy. And uh, this is what we did in Nijmegen in the Netherlands. Uh, these are some kids who participated in the study. This was our protocol. These kids came to us for 12 days. They were inpatient. And what we did was uh, four hours of bimanual training, two hours of constraint-induced therapy. And since they were um, in, in the clinic, we also did everything else. Like they had to serve their own food. They had to dress themselves. And without even knowing, we were practicing their bimanual functioning. So there were hours of training, training, training per se when they were working with a the therapist. But also the rest of their day was, in our clinic was structured in a way when they had to use both sides. Um, we are still analyzing the data, but our kids improved dramatically. They went, uh, some of them, those who were older were able to, to zip the jacket, which is a huge thing for our kids, to be able to zip the jacket. They were able to extend two arms to, to try to catch the ball. But like, in terms of hard numbers, I don't have them yet. But um, we, we realized we have to analyze each child again individually. Maybe next session, I, n next year I will report to you how they did. But I am a big proponent of the bimanual therapy with the elements of the constraint induced therapy. And I'm not a physical therapist, um, so you have to go with physical therapists you're working with. But if you ever have questions about how to do it, what we learned about our therapy, or persuading your physical therapist to try either body weight support or constraint induced or by manual, I always will be available for you. I, I will be happy to write a letter or to talk to your physical therapist. Just just email me and I'll, I'll be there to, and try to help based on this experience with hemispherectomy children. 
You're welcome to ask me questions, but before you do that, I would like to introduce uh, for five minutes Dr. Montes, who comes from the Rancho Los Amigos in Downey. That's a new rehabilitation center, new for me. Uh, they've been around for 100 years. <laughs> and what's happening right now, we are trying to forge, and we, uh, we are doing pretty well, actually. Uh, we're trying to establish a cooperation, UCLA and Rancho, in a way that all children who get operated at UCLA go and receive uh, three-week rehabilitation, post-acute uh, rehabilitation in Rancho. But also what we are seeing, that we will be bringing all of you who are interested to Rancho to run these kind of camps that I explained to you. So it's uh, two, three-week camps, and they have wonderful facilities and we will have wonderful therapists. Um, many of you already know about this therapy and expressed your interest. If you're interested, just keep us in mind. Thank you very much. <laughs>